These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. So today we were planning to enter into Canaan, but like Moses, it turns out that we aren't going to get there quite yet. I was planning to briefly discuss the matter of the Hebrews in the ancient Near East, but then that brief discussion ate up the notes for the entire episode. So next episode will be about Joshua and the conquest. And today I want to spend like half an hour talking about a single word, because it turns out this one word is actually at the heart of understanding so much about the ideology of ancient Israel and when and how they fell away from it. That word is Hebrew. Nowadays, in English, it mostly designates a language, either the classical language of the Hebrew Bible or the modern revived language of modern Israel, which was very much based on that earlier language. Sometimes the people and culture of Hebrew speakers are called Hebrew, but like so much surrounding modern Israel, everything takes on political connotations to one degree or another. In some non-English languages, the word equivalent to Jew and the associated terms is instead by, replaced by the word Hebrew. And in those languages, it takes on a bigger meaning than in English, but the modern meaning isn't so important, and in any case, it's all a consequence of the original meaning. Now, the term Hebrew, naturally, comes from the Bible, and in the Hebrew language itself, the word which we call in English Hebrew is Ivrit, or Ivrim, for plural Hebrews. Now, this comes from a root meaning over, or across, and is generally recognized as evoking outsider status, at least originally. By the time of the Greeks, Hebrew had become enough of an ethnic term for the now scattered descendants of Israel and Judah that the Greeks turned that Ivrit into the Greek word Hebraeus, and it entered into most European languages through that. By itself, it's just a word, and really barely worth a few sentences of etymological explanation. But there exists a theory which I believe to be quite credible, that the word Hebrew in the Bible is ultimately derived from the Akkadian word habiru, or in some dialects, apiru. And if this is true, I think it's more foundational to the question of where Israel came from and why it was distinct from its neighbors than many give credit for. Now, there will be no exploration of alternate theories today like with other Israel episodes. I leave things open because there is a certain fundamental uncertainty in the data which, to a large extent, is based ultimately on whether or not God exists, something that a history and literature podcast can't truly settle for all people in all times. But the question of whether the word Hebrew comes from the word apiru is unrelated to matters of God. Also, you should know that this is a topic about which the general scholarship is far less certain than I am. I'm glossing over a lot of disagreement and building a case that plenty of people will ultimately disagree with. But I think they're wrong, so there we go. To start with, we should look at who were the Habiru. We've seen them before in previous episodes, but let's assume those were all a long time ago and maybe we've forgotten about them, or maybe we didn't listen to them, maybe we just started with the Israel series. That's fine. The term first shows up in the Middle Bronze Age as a word for bandits who kill and steal. We don't have a whole lot of references this early to say if there was any additional connotation beyond that, but by the late Bronze Age, and especially in the Levant, we see a lot more discussion of these habiru. Bandits are no less common, but we have a lot more use of this particular word in the way that words, you know, they come and go in language. When we see the word habiru used, it's almost always a negative term, indicating people who are criminals, 
landless, outcasts, or otherwise shunned by society. It doesn't seem to include mere criminals, though, but rather people who live wholly outside the law. The difference, perhaps, between robbing a liquor store once and joining a gang whose sole income is robbery. The latter would be habiru, while the former is a mere criminal. But though they were often associated with banditry and raiding, not all people labeled habiru were actively involved in crime. Sometimes people would be cast out of their community, either by the community itself or because the town was conquered and the inhabitants kicked out. Similarly, escaped slaves living in the wilderness were also habiru, criminals by their standards of their day, but not, of course, by ours. And, as should be clear from just these examples, habiru was not an ethnic or cultural designation in the Bronze Age. Indeed, we see habiru with names indicating that they are West Semitic, East Semitic, Hurrian, Mitanni, and others. Habiru was a social class of people who, for whatever reason, lived outside of society and outside of the normal laws. This was not always a permanent status. There are indicators that some Habiru groups rejoined society, either through conquest or peaceful reintegration, or, and they just became normal groups again. Similarly, we have every reason to expect that individuals could move somewhat freely from Habiru to law-abiding citizen, though the scale on which this happened is small enough that we're reasoning more from the general fluidity of the social situation rather than any actual examples. Habiru status was, for most people in most of the Bronze Age, something undesirable and it's something that you accuse your enemies of being, not something you yourself claim. But later in the Bronze Age, something interesting starts to happen. Certain groups living on the fringes of society, nomad bands of a certain flavor, start to get called habiru, and don't appear to shake the term off after they settle down. We looked at the tale of Idrami the Adventurer King back in episode 77, and while he was never Habiru, or at least never says he was Habiru, he does mention that he settled among Habiru for a time, and hired them as mercenaries to help him conquer parts of Syria. It isn't clear that those Habiru bands ever lost that designation, since he was presumably writing the Stella recording his adventures sometime long after the events described. Or it actually might have been his son who wrote that particular document. We're not 100% sure. Now we have to say up front that we don't know why these mercenaries, despite backing the winning side, did not lose their Habiru status. Was it mere lingering prejudice, or was it a decision by the tribe to maintain a certain lifestyle? Now, Apiru, as a class of outsiders, could be linguistically related to the word Ivrit, both through known phoneme morphing and because Ivrit also carries a meaning of beyond. But that linguistic connection isn't strong enough to say anything for certain. It's quite possible that the Hebrews were called beyond people in a purely geographic sense, not in a social sense at all. But in fact, when we look at the Bible itself and where it uses the word Hebrew in the Old Testament, we see that there's actually a much stronger connection than this. Now, translations differ, but the English Standard Version of the Bible counts 33 uses of the word Hebrew in the Old Testament, and this covers pretty much all the times when it's used to refer to a group of people rather than a language. Now, some translations, if you do word searches on them, add about 10 more mentions to the Old Testament because they translate where the Bible says something like, the language of Judah, as just Hebrew to make things simpler for the reader. These mentions aren't super relevant to us, 
They're not unfair, it's just different translations doing different things. But the very first time it's used is in Genesis 14. Now, there are issues that I have with Genesis 14, which I've mentioned in previous episodes, but this particular section is a good one. The patriarch Abraham, here still known as Abram, has a cousin living in Sodom who's been captured by the enemy. It's all very exciting. Following this, verse 13 tells us that one who had escaped from this battle came and told Abram the Hebrew. And in verse 14, it continues that when Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, geopolitically, this verse is a mess. Dan didn't exist yet. Uh, there's more problems than that. But as a description of a Habiru tribal leader, this is pretty much spot on with everything else we know about them. He has a band of a few hundred men, every one of which is both warrior and herdsman. And he executes a lightning raid against a soft target, a loot train, being force-marched back home, and takes plunder and captives with minimal casualties. This is, to a T, what Habiru do, except here the word used is Hebrew. This is because, as I'm contending, these are essentially the same thing within the context of the Bible. Now, the next five references are all in Genesis 39 through 43, where Joseph is sent as a slave into Egypt. In all five of these references, it is Egyptians referring to Joseph or Joseph's type of people as Hebrew people. Now, a few things are important to note here. First is that Hebrew definitely is not Joseph's ethnic or cultural identity at this point. This is a social label that the Egyptians are putting on him, which includes various social barriers like not being able to eat with Egyptians. Ethnically, Joseph is a Western Semite, the grandson of a man from southern Mesopotamia, maybe Akkadian, possibly some subgroup more specific that's been lost to time. There is at this point no great population of Hebrews who are synonymous with the tribes of Israel because this is literally the first generation of said tribes, and two of the tribal founders, Ephraim and Manasseh, have not been born yet. It's hard to think what the Egyptians could possibly be referring to except to some grammatically similar word that means outsider from unsettled areas who exists outside of Egyptian society and to some extent is associated with criminal activities and a lawless life. But then in the Joseph story, perhaps even more interesting than where Hebrew is used is where it stops. The last reference is in Genesis 43. By this point, they've already stopped calling Joseph a Hebrew. He has fully integrated into Egyptian life. Instead, it is his brother Benjamin who shows up out of the wilderness and Joseph immediately orders that he be fed, but the Egyptians around Joseph grumble that Hebrew and Egyptians don't mix. Now, this can't possibly be a religious objection, since we're meant to assume that Joseph is still faithful to the God of the Bible. That's kind of the point of the whole story. And they can't possibly be ignorant of the fact that Joseph comes from the same background as Benjamin. No Hebrew here must be Habiru, a social status to be gained or lost depending on a person's social position, applied principally by outsiders to the disfavored group. The word is then not used again for the rest of Genesis because the family of Israel entering Egypt integrates in pretty quickly, since this is most likely set during the Western Semitic Hyksos dynasty, which we discussed earlier, making integration much easier. As soon as Exodus begins, however, that derogatory H-word starts getting thrown around again. 
Right off the bat, in verse 15 of the first chapter, the Pharaoh is calling some midwives Hebrews. And the first six mentions of that word are all in the narrative of the Pharaoh who hates these people and is holding them as slaves, likely war captives from when the native Egyptians defeated the Hyksos, where the Pharaoh is trying to murder all the Hebrew children. Now, murdering children is not something you do to a culture that you accept and tolerate. It's something you do to people who you view as outside of society and perhaps less than human. And again, we aren't considering the truth of this story. We're accepting this story as a story to look at the meaning of this word, which I think we're getting a pretty solid baseline for in the next verses are just going to build on that. The next two uses of the word are from the perspective of young Prince Moses. First when he sees the Hebrew man being whipped, and then when he sees two Hebrews fighting. In both cases, he's in the social position of an Egyptian prince looking down on the enslaved underclass, fitting our mold pretty perfectly. But the next uses are the most interesting. The next six times we see it in Exodus, it is as part of the phrase Yahweh, God of the Hebrews. Yahweh introduces himself to Moses as the God of Abraham, but when talking to Pharaoh, his title is God of the Hebrews, which is absolutely fascinating. It hardly needs to be said, but Egypt was a land of many gods. There was a god of the Nile, and a god of the desert, a god of the sun, and a god of the underworld. Here, Yahweh presents himself to the most powerful king of the age as the god of the trash, the god of slaves, the god of outcasts and outlaws and rejecters of all that is good in the Egyptian way of life. And this isn't a mere rhetorical trick. This is a God who inherits the younger child above the firstborn. The God who blesses the meek, the mourning, the persecuted, the reviled, the poor in spirit. The God who tells you to love not just your neighbor, but also your enemy. This is the God who makes shepherds into kings, who frees slaves, who rejects grand idols, and who ultimately dies on the cross between two thieves. The God of all things he may be, and that includes being God of the lowliest, who Pharaoh may have considered to be without the blessings of any God. This is an ideological statement elevating the least in society above the greatest, a running theme throughout scripture, the first will be last and all that. And it is confirmed by the next two mention of Hebrews. It's Exodus 21 and Deuteronomy 15, but both are saying the same thing. Slavery in general is fine, but if you purchase a Hebrew slave, he must be set free on the seventh year. Now this can be read as an ethnicity, or it can be read as Habiru social status, the idea that the people getting the law from Moses wandering in the desert now see themselves as being of this particular social status. Now after this, the word vanishes from the lexicon through the entire period of Joshua and Judges, not to reemerge until 1 Samuel and specifically 1 Samuel, not even 2 Samuel or Kings, which were all assembled as one unit, have any mentions of the H word. Every single time we hear about Hebrews in 1 Samuel is in the context of the Philistines, the great enemy of that era. The Philistines apparently called the people of Israel Hebrews at this point and it's deeply unclear if they're using it as an ethnic designation or continuing to call the Israelites Habiru, perhaps as a derogatory exaggeration. Now, there are good points in both directions here. The Philistines are not native to Canaan. They had first come from the collapsing Mycenaean Greek or perhaps Minoan Crete areas, or 
somewhere around there, and thus spoke a language in which Habiru was not even a concept in the uniquely Near Eastern sense. Rather like an elementary school child who comes home swearing for the first time, you know for sure that they learned those words from someone, but you aren't sure if they know exactly what those words mean. But what pretty clearly comes across is that the Bronze Age concept of Habiru, specifically as military bands separate from any major settled city or nation, and this is a great description of our focus in 1 Samuel. The armies of Saul and the pre-kingdom armies of David are both described in ways that make them sound very much like the famous Habiru armies of the Middle and Late Bronze Age. But what if the Philistines never knew about the famous Habiru armies of the Middle and Late Bronze Age? They may not have been calling Hebrews as roving warrior bands, they may just have been using the term because the other Canaanites were calling them that. Consider that we, in English, commonly call certain Native American cultures by names which were derogatory in origin. This is because when the first settlers and conquerors arrived, they would ask the nearest group, Hey, who are your neighbors? And they'd just assume that whatever we got told that it was an ethnic name when sometimes it was just a rank insult. And yet, this still fits with Habiru, since for the settled Canaanites, the Israelite tribes were enemies who set themselves outside of Canaanite society. Which actually brings us to the main thrust of the argument against the equating of Hebrew and Apiru. The linguistic forms can, of course, be debated either way without much firm ground being established. But given that apiru was in fact a derogatory term for a condition that no one would choose to be in, and in fact many we know worked to escape, why would Saul, in chapter 13, refer to his own people with that term? And in this one objection, I believe, lies the origins of the Hebrews and the power of that term in defining the people of Israel. It is absolutely true that Habiru was thrown around in the Bronze Age as a derogatory term and that most people entered into Habiru status unwillingly, either by being enslaved or cast into poverty and exile or merely by being born outside of the social norms of settled society. But imagine this. Imagine if a tribe found themselves, for whatever reason, to be considered outside of society. Maybe they were forced by hunger into banditry. Maybe they were escaped slaves. Maybe their villages had been conquered in some war, driving them out into the wilderness. Far from civilization, wandering princelings might hire them as mercenaries, but for the most part, they're scorned when they try to approach respectable towns. Imagine if this group, instead of moving somewhere else and trying to reintegrate themselves with society, imagine if they decided that the settled peoples of Canaan and Egypt could take their civilization and shove it up their bums. An ideological movement may have broken out among this tribe, and if the Canaanites would not let them worship their gods, then by God they would only worship their own tribal God, which the Canaanites could not take away. They would not participate in idol-making. They would scorn the settled lifestyle and its decadence. They would turn the foundational myths of the surrounding cultures on their heads to instead celebrate the herder, the nomad, and the pastoralist. Or, just as possible, what if one tribe or even one family, decided for religious or ideological reasons to reject the values of their society, what with its infant sacrifice and man-made idols and economic unfairness, and because of that, walked out of town to become Habiru of their own free will, taking the scorn of the settled people as high praise, for he wanted to be outside of their wretched society. From a purely agnostic point of view, 
either could have caused the other. And the Bible itself tells us that both may have been at play together, with Abraham leaving the city of Ur and with the slaves being set free from Egypt. Both circumstance and ideology mixed together to form a group of Habiru who did not reject that Habiru status. In fact, even after the Hebrews settled down and formed a kingdom, the prophets and holy men who were most on board with the Israelite religious mission frequently hearkened back to how much better things were in the days of the patriarchs, the days of the wilderness wandering, that is, the days when the Hebrews were still Habiru. Rejecting and being outside of the worldly, urban, Near Eastern social system was always a point of pride for the people of Israel, and always consistent with the requirements set down by Yahweh. Even later, long after the Habiru roots had faded away, there remained a biblical injunction to be in the world, but not of the world. For me, the icing on the cake is the final uses of the word Hebrew in the Old Testament, before it fades into Greek and be does become a purely ethnic term at that point by the New Testament. The prophet Jeremiah twice uses the H-word, though in both of these he's quoting the slave laws mentioned earlier, so those don't really count as new uses. But then the last use is by the prophet Jonah. He's living in times of the kingdom of Israel, and God calls him to visit Nineveh. Now, he rejects this command and flees his city, flees his home, and he runs until he runs out of dry land, and then he boards a ship to keep going. And when the sailors on that ship ask him who he is, he says to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven. He has rejected and fled from his society and his God, and the first words out of his mouth are him calling himself, potentially, a Habiru. Thematically, the people of Israel do not openly separate themselves from society after the kingdoms of Israel and Judah fall. They work as a conquered and scattered people to push forward the narrative. And perhaps as a result, we don't see the word Hebrew written in Hebrew ever again. The New Testament, which was written in Greek, where the Greeks used the word Hebrew as an ethnic designator for Israelites, does feature the word solely in that context. I want to pause here and make something clear, though. Not all Habiru were the people who became Hebrews. The people we call Hebrews, supposedly the 12 tribes of Israel, were one subset of the wider Habiru social class. So we should be wary of anyone who tries to disprove my little thesis here because not all Habiru were Israelites. They don't all need to be Israelites for this to work. And indeed, not all Yahweh worshippers need to be Habiru at any point in history for this to work either. So why am I setting apart an entire episode for the word Hebrew? It's because that word itself is at the core of what makes the people of Israel unique. We have so little archaeological evidence for who these people were or what they were doing from 1200 to 1000 BCE. And indeed, so little aside even from that, but hidden in this one word is something that does a lot of work to confirm wide portions of the biblical story. It could be, as some have claimed, that the entire Bible was made up pretty much from scratch by Judahites living in Babylon following the fall of Jerusalem. And yet, if that were the case, if they were not working off much older documents, it's hard to imagine where they could have gotten much of the ideology of the Bible, where they could have gotten much of the Habiru flavor. I think it's pretty clear that whoever wrote the Bible, however they did it, they were part of a tradition which had begun as Habiru, who were happy to be outside the social order of the day. And that continued, grew, 
and developed alongside the history of Israel in a number of ways. Now, I'll be making note of this pretty regularly as the narrative moves forward, but just to reinforce and look at the big picture. The entire Bible, start to finish, is an ideologically Habiru work. All the way at the beginning, we see the descendants of Cain building a city, while the descendants of Seth seem to live more humbly, at least at first. And Noah appears to be outside the mainstream of society prior to the flood. Abraham, of course, is defined by his exit from the great Sumerian city of Ur. And the greatest calamity of Israelite history comes when Joseph leaves the wilderness and attempts to integrate in Egypt, which starts out, well, I mean, it starts out badly, but then it goes well and then it ends badly. Abraham's cousin Lot, who moves into the city of Sodom follows a similar trajectory with the message that integrating into settled city-based society is a bad move. God's presence and God's law comes during the time of purification, that 40 years in the wilderness, when everything is pretty good despite the people having a bad attitude pretty often which aside from the bad attitude is peak Habiru existence. And who knows, maybe the Habiru were grumblers too. Anyway, then in the conquest of Canaan, something Habiru groups attempted pretty regularly, not just our Israelite Hebrews, God's primary rule for the Israelites is to never, never, never mingle with the native Canaanites, never adopt their ways or marry their women, and it's probably best to just slaughter every last one of them to avoid having their lifestyle contaminate Israel's. And it's this initial failure to remain separate, to be in the land of Canaan but not of Canaan, that the Bible sees as an infection that's never fully excised, leading to the ultimate collapse of the people. In the book of Judges, when Israel is being oppressed by local groups, they adopt all sorts of perverse ways, including child sacrifice. And without the Habiru separateness that holds the 12 tribes together, they fall into civil war. The united monarchy falls apart as Solomon begins to follow the religious practices of his 700 foreign wives, and for the later kings, the entire story is one of them falling into idolatry, or, to put it less pejoratively, the native religious practices of Western Semitic peoples. And then, some prophet who frequently either lives in the wilderness or speaks highly of wilderness living will show up from time to time. We can even see echoes of all this in the much later stories of Ezra and Nehemiah, who saw wave after wave of settler immigrant into Persian-occupied Judah succumb to the evils of integration and intermarriage. Then, even later, the Maccabees, who fought as guerrilla warriors outside of the cities, first against Hellenizing Jews and then against the Greek overlords, though once they gained power and settled into their dynasty, they too abandoned the Habiru ways and fell to decadence. Finally, of course, Jesus, as well as many of the messianic movements around his time, like the Manichaeans of John, the Essenes, the Qumran community, they all deliberately lived simple lives, often outside of cities and among the least of society. It was this which the Judahite priests leaned into during the Babylonian exile. And here is where the real sociological miracle happened. How many cultures and how many civilizations have we seen in this podcast series become conquered and subsumed by their conquerors? How many people in world history have survived being scattered and rootless? Now, the Roma, formerly called Gypsies in Europe, are one example, with a lot of Habiru similarities. But, of course, no wandering group of exiles has been wandering as long as the Jews, without losing their identity. How much of that endurance, how much of that keeping apart without integrating, can be traced back to 
to the Habiru themes of the Hebrew Bible. My guess? Quite a lot of it. Now, if you want to see the hand of God here, the entire Hebrew Bible was set up to allow the Jews to survive their scattering. If you want to see mere sociology, the Judahite priests who wanted their people to remain loyal to them during the Babylonian exile were some of the most effective social engineers in all of history. All this to say, one of the most common questions I've gotten on this show is if I think the word Hebrew comes from the word Habiru. The answer to that is yes. I think the connection is not just linguistic, but profoundly ideological in a way that has shaped both the Jewish and Christian faiths and peoples in the 32 centuries since some Egyptian prince told a couple of slaves that they would be better off out in the desert. The next episode, we will actually get to the conquest of Canaan, in which a number of these Habiru themes will play a part and we will see why many people think that there was no conquest of Canaan, and we'll look at why the Bible pretty much agrees with them. Thank you for listening.